Well, hey, welcome here. We're so glad uh, we got the chance to hang out with uh, you today. My name is Graham. I'm one of the pastors here at Morton Alliance. Uh, one thing we want to make you aware of super quick is a small update to our website. That's mortonalliance.ca. If you head there, you'll find a tab in the top right labeled My Mac. Here you can uh, find out some upcoming events that are happening, uh, steps to get financially towards things that we're doing here as a church, uh, as well as some information on our life groups. And also uh, is linked to our directory that you can add yourself if you wish. Uh, if you have the Church Center app on your phone, you already have access to all these things as well, but uh, it's going to be on the website here as well under my Mac. That's just the one announcement we have today. Uh, super excited to have you here. Let's worship together. Yeah. 
So as always, what we like to do in the middle of these times together is pause and pray for those in our community and beyond. So as you pray, I'd love for you to keep two groups in mind. The first is Brad and Jackie, who are pastors at the Alliance Church in Arviat, Nunavut, as well as Reverend Carrie Martins and her team at the, um, at the United Church here in Morden. Please uh, join me in prayer. You are 
If you're like me, you probably have lots of experiences with, with, with road trips. Whether it's because you were forced in a car with your parents to drive across the country, or it's something that you find freedom on the open road. Uh, there was one road trip that stands out to me uh, from many years ago, and we had to travel from Winnipeg to Calgary uh, for a funeral. So the occasion wasn't the best that we had to travel through, but it was during the week between Christmas and New Year's. And so we packed up the car really early, we wanted to do it all in one shot and get there uh, in time in the evening. And we left Winnipeg uh, early in the morning when it was still dark and we experienced freezing rain. Uh, everything was just uh, ice everywhere. We're like crawling along on the highway, trying to not swerve into the ditches. And uh, we're, we're glad that we finally came out of the freezing rain. And we came out of the freezing rain right around Portage the Prairie, which it was exactly when we hit like pea soup fog. We couldn't see in front of us. The, the ice was gone, but we couldn't see if there was a car behind us or in front of us. And we were just praying like, please, no one come barreling through recklessly and rear end us along the highway. By the time we hit Saskatchewan, uh, we experienced a really weird phenomenon is that they had no snow at that time, but huge wind storms that were coming through. And the wind storms were bringing like tumbleweeds that were rolling across the road and embedding themselves in the grill of our car. And it was so windy and so dusty that our windshield got sandblasted. It was pelted with all sorts of grains of sand and we had to get it replaced because it would shimmer in the sunlight because of the, the sandblasting from there. By the time we rolled into Calgary, we experienced what would be a traditional, you know, Western Canadian winter. It was like minus 20 and snow everywhere. And it was just this bizarre road trip that we went on seeing all these different, um, weather patterns that were just kind of baffling to drive through so many of them across our province. For a few years, I, I lived in Saskatchewan while we were finishing up my degree. I was at Briarcrest. And while uh, Saskatchewan may be the butt of many of my jokes, one of the things I loved about living in Saskatchewan was that you could see storms roll in because you can just see for miles. And especially where Karenport is, there's like a little bit of a rolling hill and you can see them roll in. And we just loved watching a storm roll through, especially in the summertime. Well, today we're gonna be continuing in Mark and we're gonna pick up with a different type of storm that is happening. And so I invite you to grab your Bibles. You can open it up to Mark chapter four, or of course, we will have the verses down below that you can follow along with as well. But 
Let's pick up uh, Mark chapter 4, and uh, we're going to be starting at verse 35. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, again, here's the crowd showing up again. Jesus is leaving the crowd to go preach elsewhere. They took him along just as he was, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now this scene uh, mirrors and kind of reflects a scene that we find very, at the very beginning of Scripture in Genesis, where God's word speaks to the chaos that is happening and creation is formed. I think Mark here is trying to parallel and paint a picture for the word of God, Jesus, again, being able to speak a word and have creation respond and still listen to his voice. That Jesus is more than just a simple man or a good teacher, but he has the power in his words to be able to calm storms. Now, this terrifies his disciples. Like they know Jesus. They've been with him and traveling with him, and they've seen him do miracles. Uh, he's seen people uh, have their, uh, their paralysis healed and being able to get up and walk. And here they see him speak, and he speaks to nature in a way that causes them to be terrified. But this is going to lead us to our very first question. It's this. I want to know, what is the worst storm that you have experienced? Now, we're going to move from an exterior storm to an interior storm here in this dialogue. Uh, continuing on, Mark chapter 5, verse 1, it says, uh, They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs were feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and were drowned. Those tending to the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, 
dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and told about the pigs as well. And the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. This is an interesting passage here. Jesus comes across, and admittedly, when it says it comes to the region of the Gerasenes, not quite sure exactly where that is. Scholars kind of debate exactly where it is. Uh, but they, Jesus immediately is met with this man with unclean spirits and says, we are a uh, legion. And a legion is about 6,000 soldiers. That would be a Roman legion. And so there are many evil spirits in this person who have just been tormenting him. And, uh, and it's so much so that the, the country, the, the people around in the town tried to bind him up and shoo him off to the places of, the, you know, into <laughs> the cemetery to live. And there he would harm himself and he couldn't be subdued. And Jesus gets off the boat and he immediately runs to him and he calls him out. This is one of the first times we see someone else proclaiming that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the, the Messiah. And the, the person who's doing it is demon-possessed. And so he, uh, he wants, to, <laughs> wants to be free from this, obviously. And, uh, and he sends them off into the pigs and the pigs go and drown themselves. And what a, what a weird passage this is. And I think there's a couple things that might be at play here. Uh, and part of it is, is that, you know, why would Jesus destroy some pigs? Why did the town people respond this way? Um, because we don't exactly know where the Gerasene region is, uh, a bunch of scholars think that it's primarily Jewish area by inhabitants, but there would also be a lot of Greek influence and Roman influence that would be there. Uh, so it would be kind of this mixture of Gentile and Jews living together. Now, if you are familiar with any of the, the Torah, there's, there's strict rules on what Jews can and can't do, where they can and can't go. One of them would be into the cemetery and being around dead bodies would, uh, would be a big no-no that would make them unclean. Uh, they also can't be around pigs or, or eat pigs either because the, the pigs are considered unclean as well and they're also carrying um, uh, diseases and that kind of stuff. So we, make, we understand that this region is probably a mix of Jews and Gentiles. Jesus sending the pigs away. It might actually be, some scholars think it's Jesus looking at these Jewish people whom Jesus is trying to reach at this point. And, uh, and looking at them and saying that they have completely meddled with things. They are inter, um, they are living with other Gentiles. They, uh, they might be raising pigs. So they might not be eating the pigs, but they're raising them to sell, to make money as they sell to the, uh, to the Romans who want pigs, who would be eating them. And so they've kind of like compromised uh, their, their Jewish faith as well. And so Jesus kind of destroying the, the pigs might be like a wake-up call for these Jews who should be able to then repent of how they've been living and respond to their Messiah in front of them. So a little bit of speculation in there because we're not quite sure if it's all Jewish people or who actually own the pigs, but that seems to be a pretty good consensus with a lot of scholars there. But the townspeople come out and you'd think that after they see the person who's been possessed by demons, that they would respond uh, uh, in praise and adoration and reverence that Jesus could do what no one else could do. He could free a man who has been possessed. Instead, their response is fear and they want Jesus to leave. And this is pretty interesting because they're looking at this man and his, this man's power and connection to God and, and being the Messiah is actually kind of terrifying for them. But that's going to lead us to our next question that we have here, which is this. When you think about Jesus, do you tend to emphasize his divinity or his humanity? Let's talk about that.
All right, one more story that we see in Mark, and we're going to skip ahead to Mark chapter 6. So we've had two stories, two about storms, one natural, one supernatural, one external in the weather, one internal in a person. And now we come to Mark chapter 6, and let's pick up here. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's the wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? They're baffled. They're looking at Jesus and wondering, where does he get this authority and how can he do these things? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And aren't his sisters with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives and in his own home. So they're looking at Jesus and they're saying, You're performing all sorts of signs and wonders and you're teaching and you're wise, but you can't fool us. We know who you really are. We've been around. We know your brother and your sister and there's your sisters and your mom. You're just a carpenter. And we hung out with you when you were doing carpentry type stuff. And we know your family. Don't try to pretend that you're someone that you're not. We know who you are. And Jesus responds with this. He's like, I guess, you know, a prophet is not without honor. A prophet, basically saying a prophet has honor everywhere except with the people who know him best. And he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Again, kind of a strange part of the story. We have Jesus who is able to calm the wind and the waves. He's able to release this demon-possessed man. And then he goes home. And uh, people say, but we know who you really are. You're just Mary's boy. Yeah, here are your brothers. You're acting a little too big for your britches here. You better, you know, stay in your own lane. You're kind of uh, challenging the norms that, uh, that we don't appreciate. And uh, I think this kind of brings us to a weird spot where we see both the divinity of Jesus and the humanity of Jesus. And both of those positions, the, the divine and the, the, the humanity, are repulsive to people. And the one who is divine, they look and say, he's so powerful, this is terrifying, get away from me. And we have the accessible humanness of Jesus, and people say, yeah, but you're not that powerful. You're, yeah, we know who you are. Which leads us to our next question, and the final one that we have for today, which is this. What would cause someone to put their faith in Jesus? Sometimes you might hear this, uh, God is just too powerless. If only we had a sign, if only we had a miracle performed right in front of us, well, then we'd believe. And then you might have other people who say, how can I believe in a God that's just so far away and so transcendent? How can I even relate to a God like that? So we have people who are saying he's, he's too human and people saying he's, he's too powerful. And I think this is where the beauty of Jesus comes in, where we have the divine and the human nature, and we believe as Christians that these two things come together in the hypostatic union. We have Jesus being fully God and fully man. And we can sometimes fool ourselves that all we need is Jesus to show us a sign and we'll believe. And all we need is Jesus to, to meet me in a very personal way, and then I'll believe, or then I'll put my faith in him. 
And I think this brings us to a couple implications that we have from these three stories. So we have the, the storm on the, on the lake, the demon-possessed man, and Jesus saying he couldn't do miracles in his hometown. And I want us to look at these implications. The first one is this, uh, discipleship occurs in everyday life. We're now face to face again, just like last week when we looked at the parable of the, the sower or the parable of the soils, we're faced uh, again with the Christology of who Jesus is and the discipleship action that we have to be a part of. And in these three stories, we see them again. The Christology is God's human nature and his divine nature being woven together in the person of Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. And then the discipleship element is how do we respond to that? Because I think a lot of discipleship is not about acquiring more knowledge or about uh, taking another class or um, serving in a, in a different uh, in an area that stretches you. And yes, all those are, are maybe a part of discipleship, but I think discipleship is even more normal and ordinary. It happens in everyday life, and it's this. How do we respond to Jesus' revelation to us? When we're faced with who Jesus is, fully God or fully man, we need to respond to him. Uh, in the storm, the, uh, the disciples accuse Jesus of forsaking them. They say, You've, like, don't you care about us? They accuse him of not being... Uh, present with them enough. And in this story, we're, when we're faced with our own troubles and hardships, and we can think a lot like the disciples, God, don't you care about me? Don't you, don't you care about me? I'm suffering. I'm going to die. I feel like the whole world is caving in. Why don't you care about me? This story of God calming the waves was not just there for him to show off and to flex but for us to be able to understand that in his immense power to be able to speak over the storm, he also has acute care for us. He cares about each of us individually, and that should then um, embolden us to trust him and lean into him in future things. So he shows off his power in one element, and then we have such short memories of humans, we can forget about what he has done, and the next trouble we come into, again, we cry out, oh, you've forgotten about us, God. What he really wants to be able to do is be able to allow us to trust him and be obedient to him in every step along the way. How do we respond to the things around us? How do we respond to troubles and hardships? How do we respond to life? with our worry and our fear and, and our anxiety. And I think a lot of this is discipleship. It's Jesus reveals who he is, and then we have to choose how we respond. And the anxiety that can sometimes bubble up in us uh, is really, I think, a part of uh, a lie that we are believing that we need something else apart from God to be able to feel whole. Uh, Steve Cuss, who's an, an author, uh, he wrote uh, Managing Leadership, Anxiety, Yours and Theirs. He's a pastor, an Australian guy, so when he speaks, he has a really cool accent. Uh, he says this about uh, anxiety and really discipleship when it comes to responding to, to what God is doing. He says, God has forged a new path in Jesus that leads us to life and freedom. Walking by faith, then, is the lifelong habit of trusting God's story over the story that we tell ourselves. And then he gives us a, a, a tool here. He says, contemplate this modified phrase. Jesus died to free me from needing blank anymore. Because we're given the choice to listen to the story that we tell ourselves. Oh, God doesn't care. He's indifferent. The world's there. I need, I need something apart from what God can offer in our lives. Or we can trust the story that God wants to tell through Jesus. And we all have these different things, the different blank that's there. Uh, and we need to realize that Jesus had died to free us from that. So it might be, uh, Jesus died to free me from needing to always be right anymore. Because when we're not right, then uh, we can feel anxious and worried and uh, we, we respond and we build up our own fortitude. Or maybe Jesus freed me from needing to be the smartest person in the room. Or Jesus died to free me so that I don't always have to deliver the best sermon every Sunday. 
Or Jesus freed me, uh, Jesus died to free me from needing to have the most money. Or Jesus died to free me from needing to be liked by everyone. Or whatever it might be, what is the blank that, that Jesus has died so that you can be free from? Because that's really what discipleship is. Showing God, revealing who he is and then our response to what he has done. That is discipleship. It's coming face to face with our fears and then trusting Jesus instead of the fear that we have. The second implication, I think, from these three stories is this, is that Jesus is the stumbling block for everyone. The first two stories end in fear. The disciples, terrified that Jesus can speak and control the weather. The, uh, the demoniac and the, the people who are in the town around there in the Gerasians, they are terrified that Jesus is around them. They are more fearful about, they're more fearful of Jesus than they are about the storm and the demoniac themselves. In fact, I'm pretty sure the townsfolk would just be happy to have that demoniac kind of roaming around and make sure that Jesus isn't because that just seems a little bit more safe. But in the third story, his humanity caused people to reject him. He's too ordinary. He's too big for his britches. They know him and they reject him. And it might be why living out your faith in your family or your hometown can be so difficult. People know your story. They know what you struggle with. They know your history. They know your parents' history. There's, a, there's baggage attached to that last name. There's, um, there's something that you have done that you just can't shake and people know who you are. And so it makes it harder to live out your faith. And when you do, the danger is, or maybe the reality is, when you do live out your faith and you do find freedom in Jesus and you begin to seek after him, the people who you love the most and know you the most will write you off. That's what happened with Jesus. They know him and they've experienced him and they knew him so well that they wrote off anything that he was doing there. See, sometimes we can look and it can be hard for our faith to see, look at Jesus in his humanity and the insignificance and failure that he had in his life. And yet when his power is on display, our hearts can reject him because he, he threatens us too much. See, we want him for our salvation but we want him to keep his grubby little fingers away from the rest of our lives. Because that part's scary. He's either too normal and not strong enough to save us from the things that are around us. Or he's too powerful and he threatens the things that we want. So we want him to save our souls, but stay out of our business. Just be good off to the side, Jesus, and don't mess around with my life. Uh, A.W. Tozer uh, actually reflected on this phenomenon, he said this. He, he noted that he was feeling that a notable heresy has come in, uh, into being throughout the evangelical Christian circles. The widely accepted concept that we humans can choose to accept Christ only because we need him as savior and that we have the right to postpone our obedience to him as Lord as long as we want to. Oh man, if I'm honest with myself, that's often what my rejection of Jesus is. Is I don't want him messing with my life. I want to trust him for my eternal salvation, but stay out of my bank account. Stay out of my relationships. Stay out of my calendar. Uh, stay out of what I'm trying to strive towards. Because uh, we can, the implications of trusting him as Lord are huge. It means that when he says, for us to do something, we need to respond in obedience if he's actually Lord of our life. And we might think, oh, Jesus doesn't possibly expect me to blank, does he? He doesn't possibly expect me to, to forgive that person, does he? He doesn't possibly expect me to live by those sexual ethics, does he? God doesn't possibly expect me to be that generous, does he? And we just look and we can reject it and say, ah, it's not actually what he wants. He just wants to save my soul. No, if he's, the, if he's the Messiah, if he's Lord of everything, then when he asks us to do something, we need to obey. That's what discipleship is, is responding to what God has done in, uh, in front of us. And, and our response needs to be obedience in that way. And that's just really scary if we admit it. 
Jesus is going to be the stumbling block. He's either going to be too powerful for you or too ordinary and too weak to be able to handle your problems. The third implication of these three stories, I think, is this. You'll be surprised at who responds to Jesus. Because the kingdom of God is unlike any other earthly kingdom. And the most unlikely people will respond. And like we mentioned last week, they're going to bear fruit. They're just not going to like, just grow, but they're going to produce an abundant harvest. Uh, a commentator, uh, James R. Edwards, said this. He says, the mystery of the kingdom of God is this. Some of those who have every opportunity to believe do not. And some who, like the Gerasian demoniac, who would never be expected to believe, do. No one can predict who will be insiders and outsiders. Perhaps not even Jesus, who was amazed at their lack of faith. This is sobering for us. Uh, because, again, we like to build Jesus' kingdom to reflect the kingdoms that we have of this world. But the people who respond and bear fruit are the strong and powerful, the ones who kind of have their whole life in order. They're not those messy people who struggle. They're not those people with those inner demons. They're not, n- not, uh, not those, you know, scaredy cats. We, we want just the strong, healthy, vibrant types. And yeah, and you know what? Jesus uses those people. He does. But he also uses the very unlikely people. And we might be surprised that the people we thought that would obey and follow Jesus don't. It might even be (laughs) scary when we look around inside our churches and we start wondering who here has actually had the opportunity to believe and obey and isn't. And who are those outsiders, those fringe people who feel like they're not welcome in a church? And their response to the gospel could bear huge fruit. And the implications of this are huge. We have, this is the way of the Messiah. The way of the Messiah is, is that he is fully God. And with a word, he can speak and cast out demons. With a word, he can speak and calm the storm. And he's also fully man. He's able to be there with people in the ordinary times and know them acutely and and be able to to be with them in his humanity and know what it means to be betrayed and to be hungry, to know what it means to be lonely, to know what it means to be rejected by people and write them off. He knows what that feels like. And yet we have this Messiah that comes and he combines both of them and he ushers in a new kingdom, one that's going to challenge all of the earthly kingdoms and surprise so many of us. Well, I hope you have been enjoying this journey through the book of Mark. We're going to take a four-week break from Mark during the month of February. And during that month, we're going to do a little bit of a shift, and we're going to spend four weeks. We're going to talk about uh, what the church is. We're going to examine what the church is by looking at Scripture and seeing some of the, the principles and the foundations that are a part of that there. And then in March, we're going to pick back up in Mark, and that will lead us right up until Easter. So I'm excited about this journey. Uh, thanks for coming along with us. And I've just, I appreciate everyone who's been commenting on the, the live chat during YouTube. Uh, and of course, like, like Graham had mentioned, there is an opportunity to be part of our, our digital um, uh, directory. Uh, and I'd encourage you to be able to use that to reach out to someone this week, to be able to check in and see how they're doing, to show them that they are loved and cared for and provide that, that care that we all just kind of really need at this time. Anyway, we love you, uh, we pray for you often, and we're so grateful that you are joining us and being a part of where God is taking us during this season. Grace and peace, guys. Well, hey, once again, we really appreciate uh, you getting to have this time together with us. Uh, COVID fatigue is real and it affects us all in different ways. So if you need to reach out to someone and have someone pray for you, send us an email at prayer at morethanalliance.ca and there's a whole team of people uh, that would love to support you in that. Have a great week. Hope to see you very soon.